Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Spirituality and Mental Health webinar series. This is session four, Spirituality and the Life Course of Mental Illness, Support for Patients, Caregivers, and Family by Faith Communities. I'll now turn the webinar over to our director, Shannon Royce. Shannon? Thank you, Ben. Uh, we appreciate your assistance in planning uh, this whole series. Thank you so much. My name is Shannon Royce and I'm the director of the Center for Faith and Opportunity Initiatives here at the Department of Health and Human Services. It's my privilege to welcome you today to webinar number four in our series that we're co-hosting with my good friend, Dr. Lisa Miller at the Spirituality Mind Body Institute at Columbia University. We'll begin our overview in just a moment, but before that, I wanna mention a few housekeeping items just as a reminder to you who may be new to our webinar series. First, uh, this is an educational webinar. It's off the record and not intended for press purposes. So if you are a member of the press, we ask you to allow us to connect you with the Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs Office at the end of the program. Second, we've already heard some feedback this morning, uh, which at times happens. If you're having difficulty hearing us through your computer, we encourage you to use the phone number that's offered by Zoom Sometimes uh, folks have an easier time hearing uh, through that mechanism. We will be sending a link to today's program to everyone who registered for the webinar. So watch for that email in this next couple of days. Uh, we will share whatever slides our speakers are willing to share with us. And if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us at partnerships with an S, partnerships at hhs.gov. Finally, we do have a very full program today, and so if you have questions that you'd like us to present to our speakers at the end of the program, we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen uh, to put your questions there for us to consider at the end. Now I'll turn it over to my friend, Dr. Lisa Miller, for her opening remarks. Hello, Lisa. Hello. Thank you, Shannon. And as always, it is such an honor and a joy to collaborate with you and the Partnership Center. Um, we come from here, the Spirituality Mind Body Institute at Columbia University Teachers College. The Spirituality Mind Body Institute develops science and uses science to help seed a more spiritually supportive society, focusing on mental health and human flourishing. I hope that you all will join us for all six of our webinars. It's been a delight to receive your feedback via email. Both Shannon and I have received wonderful contact information and ideas from you. And so it is um, my great joy to reconvene once again with all of you. Today, we're talking about a very powerful and wonderful form of support. It is spiritual and religious support of the many ways that we can come together and in the many places that we can come together. There is something uniquely buoyant and loving and curative in the way that we can bring to one another religious and spiritual social support. And I have just a few science slides. Um, if I might then ask for the next slide. Um, we've spoken how trauma and suffering is a gateway to a deepening of spiritual life and that spiritual and religious life can shed light on our suffering. Ever more is that the case when we show up for one another in this way. Next slide. And so I'm going to share with you two major sets of findings. The first is from Ken Kemmler and his colleagues who found in a study of over 2,600, next slide please, a very um, broad reaching effect of what he called social religiosity, which was effectively religious and spiritual social support. Social religiosity, as Kellner and his colleagues identified, was protective against both internalizing and externalizing disorders. On the internalizing side, as you can see here, third line going horizontally, were meaningful protective benefits against depression, GAD, generalized anxiety disorder, and phobias. And on the externalizing side, if we may, against alcohol dependence, drug dependence, and next slide, please sociopathic behavior, antisocial. So what um, might be asked of the skeptic, who's always most welcome, the skeptics welcome along with the intuitive and the knower and all others to the table. And what's so special 
is it really just the same spiritual social support and regular support well that question was addressed head on next slide please in a sample of over 2000 african americans and this is a wonderful study um, this is by katrina debdom and her colleagues and what was found next slide please is that ordinary social support while nice is not by any means the same as spiritual social support if we look down um, up and down right here vertically, the social support column, we see that um, by way of comparison, a large correlation would be 0 0.8, 0 0.7, a moderate correlation would be 0.5, but only here 0.26 is a relatively small correlation seen between social support and religious support, the emotion received, the emotion provided, and the anticipated reliance on religious support. So based on this data no in fact there is something quite distinct about who we are to one another in spiritual and religious forms of social support um, i'm so honored that we have two tremendous leaders here today who shannon will introduce um, really dr harold koenig was the one who put religious and social support on the map of clinical science he was the first in decades ago a great field builder. And of course, you know, Kay Warren has touched the lives of thousands through her very far reaching, moving and powerful work. So we're honored to be here today. Shannon, take it away. Thank you so much, Lisa. We really appreciate joining with you in this whole series. It's been a joy to work with you. It is my privilege now to introduce um, Dr. Harold Koenig. Um, we'll introduce our speakers in turn. And so I'll introduce Dr. Koenig and have him speak and then we'll turn to Kay after his remarks. Dr. Koenig is Professor of Psychiatry and Associate Professor of Medicine at Duke University Medical Center and serves as facult faculty at multiple academic programs around the world. He's board certified in general psychiatry and formerly in family medicine, geriatric medicine, and geriatric psychiatry. Dr. Koenig has nearly 550 scientific peer-reviewed academic publications, 100 book chapters, and more than 50 books. He received his undergraduate education at Stanford University, medical school training at UC San Francisco, and geriatric medicine psychiatry and biostatistics training at Duke University. Dr. Koenig has been featured on many national, international TV news programs and hundreds of national, international radio programs and newspapers and magazines. He's given testimony before Congress concerning the benefits of religious faith. He's the recipient of the 2012 Oscar Pfister Award from the American Psychiatric Association. As you can see, he has quite the history and so much for us to learn from him today. Dr. Koenig, it's such an honor to be with you. Thank you for joining us. We'll turn the program over to you now. Thank you, Shannon, for that wonderful introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. And then I will bring up my PowerPoints. I hope I can figure this out. I think I can. <laughs> so here we go. So I'm going to talk with you all about faith community support for patients with mental illness, caregivers, and families, and focus on the research that's been done looking at the connections between religious faith, religious community activity, and, and health, particularly mental health. So um, in general, I'm gonna talk about the importance of social support to health and well-being for virtually everyone, the role that the faith community plays in providing support, both positive and negative support at times, talk about research looking at the connections between faith community involvement and mental health, and then consequently on physical health, and then look at some research uh, examining the effects of religious faith on the mental and the physical health of caregivers, caregivers who may be stressed by their, by their duties. And then we'll look at some 
further resources to provide more information in this area. So social support, health and well-being. Um, one could define social support as understanding, accepting, compassionate, encouraging social interactions where the supporting person listens, cares, and wants the best for the person. Social support is truly one of the most important aspects of counseling and it's crucial for the development of the relationship between a patient and their therapist or counselor. Informal social support provided by family and friends is also known to be essential for good mental health and physical health. And of course, the opposite is also true with regard to loneliness and social isolation, which is so common among people who struggle with mental illness and, and their loved ones who care for them. Over 30 years ago, um, house researchers uh, found that those without social support were less psychologically and physically healthy and were more likely even to die sooner. And more recently, in an analysis of nearly 150 studies that involved more than 300,000 participants, those with adequate social relationships were 50% more likely to survive during an eight year follow up period compared to those with poor or insufficient social relationships. So this just underscores how important our social interactions are to one another. It's been tough during this COVID-19 pandemic on everybody. You know, it's just not the same when you got a mask on, when you have to social distance with people, where you can't talk with them up close, hug, shake their hands, pat their backs. You can't do any of these things. And, and it's taken a toll on, on, on many, many people, especially those struggling, you know, with, with in high stress situations like caregivers might be of, of those who, uh, you know, are struggling with themselves with feeling lonely and isolated. Um, in fact, research has shown that the lack of social relationships has an effect on physical health that is comparable to smoking to smoking cigarettes, to obesity, to physical inactivity, and to high blood pressure. So if you, were, if you had high blood, blood pressure, wouldn't you go see a doctor to try to lower that blood pressure given the impact that it has on your heart and on your brain? Um, the, same, the same has to do with, with uh, not having enough social support. Okay, so social support oftentimes has comes from faith communities. And in fact, in certain segments of the population, such as older adults, um, research has shown, in fact, our research has shown that um, outside of the family, the church, the religious community, the synagogue, the mosque, is the most common source of support that the people in the community ex have. Uh, other than family, it's the, it's the religious community, which serves as kind of an extended family for many, many people. <coughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> so um, social support from the faith community is kind of like a two-way street. Here's an example of the kinds of questions that are asked in order to assess the kind of support one might receive from one's faith community. How often do people in your congregation make you feel loved and cared for? Ask yourself these questions. How often do the people in your congregation listen to you and talk about your problems and concerns? And then of course, more importantly, how often do you make people in your congregation feel loved and cared for? How often do you listen to people in your congregation talk about their private problems and concerns? One thing research has shown is that it is most definitely more beneficial to give than to receive. So providing support to others 
loving others, supporting others often neutralizes many of the negative emotions that we often experience and enhance the positive emotions. Now, faith community can also provide some negative support as reflected by how often do people in your congregation make too many demands on you? How often are people in your congregation critical of you and the things you do? So that, that can also have an effect and the effect is not a good one. Positive congregational support, as in the first few questions, is consistently related to better health, better mental, social, and physical health. Negative congregational support, in turn, is very consistently related to worse physical, social, and psychological health. So some of this, uh, so the question is, is faith community involvement good for your health? And here's a bit of a review of some of the research. This is some of the sources that I will be speaking from. If you want to learn more, look at some more of the, the actual evidence for this. So faith community involvement and mental health. Let's briefly take a look at this. Involvement in the faith community on average is related to better coping with life stressors, greater recovery, more quick recovery from depression, experience of less depression because of improvements in coping. But of course, that does not mean that people of deep faith do not become depressed. Oftentimes depression or the dark night of the soul is the pathway to a deeper religious faith. When things are going well for people, there's not much motivation to deepen your faith and your relationship with God. But when things are not going well, that's when you've tried everything else, when there's nothing left, that's when people come to peace. Religious involvement is also related to less anxiety less alcohol and drug use, fewer substance use disorders. Also the experience of not only fewer negative emotions, but more positive emotions, such as happiness, life satisfaction, optimism, meaning and purpose in life, gratitude and generosity. People who are more religious are more likely to be altruistic with their time and with their money. They have greater marital and family stability. They are less likely to engage in delinquent acts and crime. And also the support one receives from one's faith community is of a greater quality than the social support that one receives from other sources, as, as Lisa pointed out earlier. Um, the kind of support from a faith community persists even when the person being supported can't give back. And that's what's so unique about the faith community support is that we, sp we support one another, not because of what we get from others, but because God has commanded us to love our neighbor. So that's an additional motivation for people to care for and love one another in the faith community. Here's a study looking at um, this is out of the Harvard School of Public Health, looking at suicide rates among women. Uh, this is a large random sample of nurses, actually, 90,000 uh, nurses who were followed for a period of about 15 years, showing that rates of, of, of completed suicide are much lower among those who are attending religious services at least once a week. Now, as I said earlier, faith community involvement also has impacts on physical health. People who are more involved in religious community activities, particularly religious community activities, have less heart disease, lower blood pressure, lower rates of stroke. You know, I, I'm not just saying this. This is not just hearsay. This is based on solid research that's been published in peer review academic journals in medicine, nursing, psychology, public health, less cognitive decline with aging, less physical disability with aging. 
better immune function, better endocrine functions, lower death rates from cancer, and greater overall longevity. And of all of the religious characteristics, it's involvement in the religious community, religious service attendance, that is the strongest predictor of physical and mental health outcomes. So we all know that, you know, just going to church doesn't often, you know, you know, it isn't the entire, you know, explanation here, but it seems that going to church is, includes a package of things, a package of things having to do with getting up and going to church, listening to the sermon, which provides guidance for living, uh, singing, praying with one another, socializing afterwards. It's a whole package of things. It's not just attending church. You can see here uh, quickly, this is out of the Harvard School of Public Health, again, looking at all-cause mortality, about one-third lower among those attending religious services more than once a week. It's true for heart disease, cardiovascular mortality, and for cancer mortality. So faith as a support for caregivers. Religious involvement in a study that we did of 250 caregivers, um, as people were more involved in their religious faith, including religious community involvement, caregiver resiliency significantly increased. And that's independent of many other factors. Also, we measured the telomere length inside of the caregiver's cells. Telomere length is a, is a genetic indicator of longevity. It's kind of a how it, it predicts how long cells actually live. And what we found was that as caregivers were more involved, both in their religious community and in their religious faith, that telomere length actually was longer among those who are most involved in their, in their faith community and who had a strong religious faith. It's the combination. It's not just one or the other. The combination of a strong relationship with God, commitment to one's faith tradition, and engagement with the faith community that seems to be most powerful. So in summary, for all people, social support is key to good mental and physical health. The faith community is an important source of social support, perhaps the most important source outside of the family for most Americans who are members of faith communities. And that's more than half of the US population. Involvement in religious community activity is related to better mental health, better physical health, better greater longevity, and is the strongest predictor of physical health of all religious characteristics. Religious faith is also a strong correlate of psychological adaptation and is a genetic marker of longevity among caregivers who are undergoing a great deal of stress. So a few resources. This is a book that recently came out and the next speaker uh, provided a wonderful, wonderful testimony in this book for, for, the, for this book. Uh, Kay Warren is just an incredible person and has been through experiences in her life that, uh, that are, you'll, you'll hear about that in a moment. Um, here is of the 55 books that I've written. This is the best. This one is the best. This is, you are my beloved, really. This is a little book talking about God's love in all of the different religious traditions, how God has expressed his love for us and how to more deeply experience that love. So that's that. And here's our website if you want more information. And other than that, I'm finished. Thank you so much, Dr. Koenig. What a joy to hear you and hear from your vast experience. I have learned just listening to this. It makes me want to go do more research and learn some more. We are so privileged now to turn to our next speaker, uh, Kay Warren. Um, it, she really does not require an introduction, but I'm going to do one anyway. Kay Warren co-founded Saddleback Church with her husband Rick Warren in Lake Forest, California in 1980. After the death of her son Matthew, 
who lived with serious mental illness for most of his life, she founded Saddleback's Hope for Mental Health Initiative as a way to support individuals and family members of loved ones with mental illness and suicidal ideation. The initiative also trains others in the faith community how to launch or expand existing mental health ministries. Kay is a board member of the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention and is active in mental health suicide prevention efforts in Orange County, California. Kay is the author of multiple books and resources for churches. Her children are Amy, Josh, and Matthew, who is in heaven, and she has five grandchildren. Kay, where Dr. Koenig shared uh, from his research, knowledge, and experience, we're anxious to hear from you, from your life experience and the work that you've done. So we'll turn the program over to you now. Thank you so much. Um, it's just a pleasure to be on this webinar and to be with Dr. Koenig, who um, just an amazing um, man and uh, researcher and physician and um, a brother in, in, in my faith. So thank you so much, Dr. Koenig. Um, as you've heard, our youngest son, Matthew, was diagnosed with depression when he was um, seven years old, and he probably could have been diagnosed sooner um, if we had known that children could experience mental health. We didn't know. My husband was the senior pastor of a very large, uh, very loving church that was supportive and nourishing of us personally, but there was almost no help for us as parents of a seriously mentally ill child. There were no support groups that we were aware of for family members, and even if there had been, I'm not sure we would have gone for privacy concerns. And there was no mental health education available through our church or even really from the mental health professionals that we saw on a regular basis. No one suggested to us that we find a support group, that there was anything like NAMI that offered um, free uh, information and education for parents. And as a result, we often felt very alone and helpless as our son's illness steadily progressed um, through the years. And after Matthew died by suicide in 2013, my husband and I realized that we had uh, a unique opportunity at Saddleback Church to increase the level of mental health education, um, services and support for individuals and family members living with mental health challenges. And we created an acrostic using the word uh, church. And we put um, steps along with each of those letters of that acrostic that, that became a template for what we believe are things that every, every faith congregation can use to help people living with mental illness and their families. People assume that because our church is large, that of course we can help people in concrete ways. But I'm absolutely convinced that there are very specific things that every faith community can do everywhere in every city in the United States, regardless of location, regardless of size, regardless of the, the affluence of the church. There are things that cost absolutely no money and um, they are within the reach of every, every congregation. So I'm going to explain just briefly this church strategy using the word church, but if you're, um, you could use the word masjid, you could use mosque, you could use temple, you could use shul, whatever you want to, to use your faith community's place of worship as, um, as this basis for this acrostic of what, what practical things you can do. And the first um, letter in that acrostic is C. And it stands for care for and support individuals and families living with mental illness and their families. And Dr. Koenig has already um, spent a lot of time explaining the practical and the health, the mental health, the relational benefits to being a part of a faith community. And I'm going to give some practical ways um, that I feel like that, that we can actually implement that. And so I'm gonna spend the most of my time on this first C in the acrostic, and then I'll come back at the end and fill in those last letters. But that's because this webinar is about how to give spiritual support to individuals and to families. It starts with this question though of how much does it cost to care? How much does it cost a congregation to care for people living with mental illness and their families? And the answer to that is it costs nothing in terms of money. What it costs is a decision, an intentional commitment to live out our faith in such a way that we care for 
um, people who are living with mental health challenges and their families. And so it doesn't really matter what size your congregation is. It doesn't matter where you're located. It, none of that matters because it's about making a decision, making an, an intentional effort to care for people who are living with mental illness. And um, as Dr. Koenig has mentioned, we need support in every area. All of us do as human beings and people living with mental illness and their families need support. They need physical support. They need relational support. They need emotional support. They need therapeutic support, but they also need spiritual support because we are not just bodies. We are souls. Um, one of my favorite uh, writers, authors, and um, mentors from afar is Dr. John Swinton, a professor of practical theology and pastoral care at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. And some of his research showed that the question that people with serious mental illness ask most often isn't simply, where can I find meaning in the midst of my brokenness? But much more specifically, where and how can I find Jesus and hold on to God in the midst of this experience of living with mental illness? And so if I want to offer spiritual support to people in our congregation who are living with, in, with mental illness, um, I a, a, want to show you um, what we call the hope circle, because this is the way to flesh out what I believe it means to care for people um, who are living, individuals who are living with mental illness. And if you start at the left, um, where it says um, you are loved, if you look, there's tiny words above it. And those words above it say, I hate myself. And that's because what I heard my son say over and over, what I have heard so many individuals living with serious mental illness say is that they hate themselves. There's so much shame. There's so much embarrassment. There's so much um, shame at the fact that maybe they haven't lived up to the potential that they thought that they had. Maybe the illness itself intrudes and causes deep feelings of, of, of self-hatred. Of, of loathing and to know more than anything that you are loved, that whether you accomplish some of the things that you've set out to accomplish, whether it's been a good day or a bad day, but to know at night when you lay your head on the pillow that you are loved is the basis of spiritual support for people living with mental illness, to know that they are loved by God. Remember I said, Dr. Swinton said that people wanna know how can I stay connected to God? It starts with knowing you are loved. And then as you go around this circle, I'd say the next thing that I heard often from my son and from other people living with serious mental illness is this, I don't matter. I think sometimes with serious mental illness, you can feel like you are alone in the universe and that other people are, are very particularly gifted and maybe they're wanted and there's, there's really, but there's nothing for you. There's no meaning. And to know that you have a purpose that you were made intentionally, that, that there is a reason for you to be here, to know that you are loved and that you have a purpose in life, those become some of the foundational truths that we can spiritually support people living with mental illness. And if you keep going around that circle, I heard often, my son would say, I don't fit in. He would just say, I don't belong. And at his most desperate moments, in the moments when he was the most tormented, by thoughts um, that he couldn't control, by, by feelings, by feeling alienated. He would say, I don't even fit in the human race. He saw himself as, as being outside of humanity. And I can't think of anything more lonely than to feel like you don't even belong in the human race. What a desperate, desperate, um, what a desperate place that is to be. And so as we support spiritually people who are living with serious mental illness, to show them that they belong, that they fit, that they may not fit here in society and they may not fit there, but they fit in our congregation. There's a place for them. Keep going around that circle. Um, to help people living with serious mental illness, to support them into recognizing that they have choices. Because it can feel often like the mental illness takes over and there is... You have no choices. You, you can't control your thoughts. You can't control how you feel. You can't control how you respond. And to, to bring this truth to folks that they do have some choices, even if the choice is as, as basic as just to say, I need help. I need help is a choice to ask for it. And then if you go to the last um, thing that I have heard, oh, well, sorry, I, I've, yeah, I've heard people say, I wanna give up because they feel like there's nothing they can do. 
but to realize there's a choice. And then also have heard so often, I feel useless. I have nothing to give. Everybody else has these beautiful gifts to offer. I have nothing to give. But to know that you are needed, that your particular contribution is the contribution that you were here to give. And we are less than what we could be if we don't have your contribution, to know that you are needed. And so as we um, emphasize this hope circle in caring for people living with mental illness um, at Saddleback, it is to remind them over and over and over again by our actions, by our words, by our touch, by our love, by our kind looks, you are loved, you have a purpose, you belong, you have choices, and you are needed. And there's a journal that we've created called the Journey Toward Hope that was um, created by people living with mental illness for people living with mental illness. It's an experiential journal to help these five truths of the, of the hope circle to become cemented in someone's heart. And then I wanna quickly just talk about, because we're not only called as a faith congregation to offer support to individuals, but to caregivers. Um, and I lived for 20 years as a caregiver of my very seriously mentally ill son and people who are caregivers, who are the family members, need safe, compassionate spaces where they can do three things, where we as caregivers and family members can examine and engage the truth about our lives, where we can embrace the resulting sorrow and grief that comes from a very hard look at the reality of our lives, and then a safe and compassionate space to begin to expand our hope. So let me just briefly talk about what I mean, because I have walked, if you're a caregiver, I have walked maybe in your exact shoes or very close to it for those 20 years of caring for my son. And as his mental illness began to become more and more and more serious. And the goal here of what I'm talking about, how we can spiritually support caregivers is to help them really take a hard look at the realities of what it's like to have a seriously mentally ill family member. Most of us are, are really good at, we're, we keep paddling, we keep moving because we're so afraid if we stop, this little shaky house of cards that's holding us up is gonna collapse and we'll never, we'll never get up. If we start to cry, if we start to really look at things, um, we'll give up. And so we just keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. But we all need safe places where we can say, you know what, here's the truth about what goes on in our family, to talk about some of the, the psychosis, to talk about sometimes the violence, to talk about the chaos, the, the, um, the untenable choices and decisions that come with having a family member who has a serious mental illness. Those are things that can bring us to shame. And if we can't look at them full in our face, we can't even move on to how we cope with it. And we need spiritual support to take a hard look at ourselves. Secondly, we need have a safe place to embrace the resulting grief and sorrow that come. If you take a hard look at the reality of what is going on with your loved one, when you begin to think sometimes of what could happen to them, what if the outcome of them is um, they die or they are on the street or they you never hear from them again because they walk away. I mean, the pain of that is almost unbearable and but we need to, once we've looked at that reality, to be able to grieve, to be able to mourn, to be able to have a place where others can encourage us to let go, because that's the primary work of grief, letting go, letting go of control, letting go of control of our loved one, letting go of control of how we wish life would be. It's a, it's a place we need to have in our faith communities, a place to lament, a place to be able to cry out to God and say, how long, oh Lord, will it be like this? How long can we keep living like this? How long can we live with this kind of grief? And sometimes to have just the tender voice of another sufferer, a touch on the shoulder, a kind look that reminds us that we're not meant to grieve alone, that we really are better together. Yes, it's tough, but to have a, a place where we can let our grief be known. And then the last thing I would say of how we can support caregivers in not only taking a look at reality, not only embracing the grief and the sorrow that comes from taking a look at reality, but then a place where hope can begin to expand in us. We all want to get to hope, but none of us want to go through the grief that gets us to hope. Because if you don't go through grief, you're only going to have optimism. The only way to get to true hope is to go through grief. And grief, I mean, hope is, hope is um, 
Hope is not this bedazzled thing. Hope is gritty. I mean, it's got skinned knees. It has tear-stained faces. Real, true, solid hope that has taken a look at reality, that is embracing the sorrow and the grief that comes from that, has a kind of hope that is gritty and tough and will get you through any of the circumstances. It leaves us with this belief that, that nothing of God's ends in ashes. That, as Brueggemann says, even in a free fall, the end will not prevail. And this is the kind of support, the spiritual support that families and caregivers need. Not somebody slapping a pretty bow on it, telling them to just pray more, read the scriptures more, confess a sin or stop doing that. We don't need that kind of spiritual support. We need the spiritual support that allows us to look at reality, to grieve it, and then to build hope. Let me close with the rest of this church acrostic that maybe we can cover um, in the Q&A time. But if it's church, C-H-U-R-C-H, the first C is to care for and support people living with mental illness and their families. The H is to help with practical needs. The U is to use volunteers. This is not something that staff or paid staff members are supposed to do. This is what we as members of a congregation. The R is to remove the stigma, probably next to care, making an, a decision to care. The most powerful, effective thing any congregation can do is to remove the stigma. It is not a sin to be sick. And then the, um, then the second C is to collaborate with the community, people like Dr. Koenig, people like Dr. Miller, those who are mental health professionals who can come and talk and share and educate our congregations. And then the last is hope. I've talked about hope a lot because listen, you can't live without hope. And it is in the DNA of the faith community to offer hope. And so these are things, these are practical ways and um, that all of us, every faith congregation, can support spiritually uh, people and families who are living with mental health challenges. Thank you so much, Kay. It's always very moving to me to hear uh, you share. And uh, I really appreciate the heart that you bring to this and the personal uh, touch that you bring to it. The two of the things you said that particularly moved me um, were just the importance of lament uh, just how lament is a part of the journey of those living with mental illness and their caregivers, um, because you can't move forward without actually really looking at and deeply grieving the loss that you have of what you thought would be a more typical life. And so I think that's really beautiful that you raised that. Um, and the other thing you said that I think is so significant, and we'll turn to questions after this, but I just wanted to comment on these two things. The importance of um, not trying to control circumstances you can't control, but learning to manage them and having the support around you to manage uh, the challenges of your life, but not try to control the uncontrollable. So thank you so much for sharing those things with us. And I see that Lisa and Dr. Koenig have joined us. And so, Lisa, I want to turn to you first for any questions that you might have for Kay or Dr. Koenig, and then I'll raise questions as we have time. Well, first of all, thank you, Kay, and thank you, Dr. Koenig, for your very moving and powerful talks. Um, Kay, I'll remember that the rest of my life. It was very beautiful, and I took a screenshot of your diagram so I can share it with my students, and we'll, of course tell them of all about you. Um, I want to share an impression I had that both of you highlighted the deep, deep love that is part of spiritual social support. Harold, you shared how we're loved even if we can't give back. And Kay, you shared how we're loved even if we can't live up to what we hoped for ourselves, even if we don't meet our own mark that we somehow seem to have set. And I think that is a very special and unique and curative way of coming together. Um, I'm wondering if you might both share a word. I mean, what makes spiritual social support so much more transformative? If I'm viewed not as, you know, what job I just got or lost or how much money I have or lost, but as God's child, as a soul on earth, as a being of infinite worth, then you and I are in an entirely different 
place. We are on a different, deeper bedrock. And I'm wondering if you might share just maybe a story or more about um, spiritual social support. Dr. Koenig, go ahead. <clears throat> well, Lisa, you know, I, th I think it really begins with, with God's love for us, that, that God, God truly loves us. He's created us with the meaning and purpose, every single one of us, as Kay described in, 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 in her presentation, um, we, every one of us, God has created for some reason. And if we don't live out that reason, I mean, God still loves us whether we live it out or not, but, but, but even if we don't live it out, you know, uh, it, we're here for some reason. And Every person affects dozens of other people, dozens, hundreds of other people in kind of a wave of influence. And, um, you know, through, through, that, uh, through that love that, that, that God puts in us, that's really the only way we can truly love other people, I, I think. You know, people are just hard to love. Most people are hard to love, particularly people you live with, people who... You, who you live with, including your faith community, people are hard to love. But with God's love inside of you, filling you up, I think that is the way that you can love people unconditionally. That's the only way that you can love people unconditionally if God's love is in your heart. So um, that's the kind of spiritual support, the support that ultimately comes from God, the love that comes from him into a person that then fulfills them and enables them to love others. Because a lot of this, as I said earlier, is being other people, providing the spiritual support to others. That's the solution to many of our problems. We, we, we absorb it from God who loves us. We take out all of the stuff that stands in between God's love to us and our experience of that love. And then the the giving that love out to others, that's the kind of spiritual support that, uh, that cures and heals. Yeah, I, I, I just think um, I, I, because, because my son said so many times, the, I, I mean, he really did develop as um, a self-loathing. And um, I think that was the hardest thing for me to combat in talking to him as his mother um, and ultimately, you know, he died um, partially. I mean, I can't give all the reasons. I don't know them all, but I just know that that somehow that truth that he mattered and that he was loved was very difficult for him to grasp. And yet what I believe with all of who I am is that, that I I am a person made in the image of God and therefore I have value and worth dignity, meaning, I, I am loved simply because I exist. I'm not loved because of what I can produce or what I can achieve or because of what acclaim I might or what pinnacle I might come to, what degrees are behind my name, how much money I make. I'm just loved. And to, to feel that in the core of of who we are as persons enables us to live our lives. It, it is the, it is where we, it's what we fall back on. Um, and everybody has good days and bad days, everybody, whether you're living with a mental illness or not. And even if you aren't, there still can be that voice in our head that says you failed, man, you blew it today, or you didn't do this, or you didn't do that, or you didn't do that right. But to know, that we are loved for the fact that we exist, we have breath in our lungs, is probably the most free reality that I live with. It has carried me every one of my 66 days in my 66 years, and it will carry me until the day I die. I am loved. I'm loved. Magnificent, thank you both. Um, and when we look at each other that way, it seems to awaken that awareness in, in one another, that we are worthy of love. 
And Lisa, I'd like to add one thing. I think one of the things for caregivers uh, that is so important to know and appreciate is um, I think so often as a caregiver, you can feel like that failure. You know, you're not doing, you must not be doing enough or it wouldn't be so bad. And I think one of the things that we need to be telling caregivers is that they aren't just loved, they are actually extraordinary. They're extraordinary parents because they are parenting extraordinary children and it calls them to be extraordinary. And they are rising to that by continuing to walk with um, and love that family member living with mental illness. And I just, I just wanted to mention that because I think that's so critical, um, the stigma that goes not just with the individual living with mental illness, but the family and the, the tendency to live um, in silence uh, because you don't know if it's safe uh, to share, um, even in faith communities. And so for any, any parents out there, any family members living with someone uh, with serious mental illness, I just wanna to say to you, you are extraordinary uh, because of the journey that you are walking. I would agree totally. Um, you know, caregivers are truly warriors. They're truly warriors. Um, they've, they've been through they are going through war. I mean, this is literally war, dealing with the stresses and the, and the situations that, that come up every single day. This is, this is truly like being in the trenches. So um, sur surviving as a caregiver should be, caregivers should be saluted as warriors. Lisa, any other questions? Um, thank you both very much. Shall we go to questions from our- Sure, narrative? I have several questions from, from our participants today, so I'm delighted to turn to a couple of those. Um, one of the questions that came up was, does social support look different in different minority or, or vulnerable populations? Uh, the study at the beginning looked at the African-American communities and social support but is there research or are there experiences that any of you can share that relate what it is we're talking about when it comes to diverse communities? I probably well, be for Lisa or Dr. Koenig. <laughs> the, uh, you know, social support looks, looks the same, I think, in all communities because in all diverse, because all diverse communities are humans. They're, they're made of human beings created in God's image. And loving one another, I think looks the same. Um, certainly the research is more complex when you're doing studies in minority communities, particularly communities such as the, as the LGBT community where there are issues there that, that uh, you know, I, I know there was uh, several questions asked with regard to that community in particular. And I was just, I was thinking of the response, you know, people who are involved in communities that accept them, that embrace them, how, who, who they are, are, are the kinds of healing communities that, uh, L G T B T or whatever people need to be involved in. They need to find those communities because when you're involved in those kinds of embracing communities, that's where the healing comes. That's where the true support, when you're loved in those communities, um, you know, wherever you can find them, not all churches provide that support. There are some that do. So you have to find them. You have to ask other people other people in your, in your group, among your friends, people you trust, people you love, where, are they, where do they feel welcome? What kind of, what religious community do they feel welcome, accepted, cared for, and loved? And then get involved in that community. 
I've noticed as I've looked across the literature that spiritual social support buoys us up to address whatever is germane in our path and our community. So for instance, in the excellent study that was shared in the beginning, in a sample of over 2,000 African Americans, religious social support was associated with improved nutrition, greater exercise, and decreased use of alcohol. In other studies, religious and spiritual social support, for instance, in um, studies on refugees, was associated with adaptation facing those specific challenges, and so on and so on. Studies of religious and social support onto people in specific medical communities or with specific medical com conditions. So it's, it's a very important question, and what I find most remarkable is that whatever I may be faced with, and no matter who I may be and how I may be packaged, spiritual and religious social support brings me both the fullness of being, the emotional shoulder to lean on, and the tangible necessities to rise up and meet my challenge. And that is remarkable as we look across communities and cross faith. I'm so grateful you asked that. Dr. Koenig mentioned the negative support from faith communities and some comments mentioned some populations that might struggle to participate in faith communities. I think that's some of what we were just talking about. How does social support relate to these challenges? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. You know, how does it relate to those situations uh, where, where people maybe are just uh, introverted just because of their personality perhaps or it's hard for them to engage in in community in community activities i mean i could speak i could give my own personal testimony of that i can spend weeks months in front of my computer alone be totally happy there you know that that requires a certain personality um uh, but but you know, uh, that's that's the reason I engage in faith community activities, uh, is is because of of my faith itself. Because that's that's what I, you know, that's what I believe God wants me to do. So I I think for individuals who have a hard time getting involved, um, I would encourage you to pray to God for the the strength. To just do it because you know when i do it when i get engaged in, in religious community activities really i feel like i'm rewarded for doing that i mean just the situations that that arise i mean there are benefits to doing so even for the the, the introvert and many people don't realize that that if you if you follow if you do what god wants you to do and god definitely wants you to engage with others to love your neighbor as yourself um when you do that there is a reward for that 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 things happen that you wouldn't anticipate it's it's really kind of surprising miraculous in some ways that when you just force yourself to get out there and to involve yourself and to be kind and encouraging of other people in whatever interactions you have magic begins to happen I think one of the other things uh, we should keep in mind, Dr. Koenig and uh, Lisa Kay, is that for some people, um, part of their mental illness may prevent them from doing those very things. And so it would be like saying to someone who is in a wheelchair, you can join us uh, for our program and we'd love to have you here, but we meet on the third floor and we don't have an elevator. So if you can get up there, We'd love to have you with us. And I think the reality is as, as people in faith communities, we have to recognize that people living with mental illness in some cases, they can't come to us. We have to get out of our faith communities and go to them. We need to go where they are. We need to meet them where they are. And that may be uh, the homeless person on the street, that may be uh, some parent who doesn't know where their child is because they've run away because of their mental illness. Uh, there are so many stories like that where I completely agree with you, Dr. Cohn, people like you and me, we need to be 
going to our faith communities, but for those people living with serious mental illness, part of that mental health challenge may be not being able to get to the third floor without the, the accommodation or assistance um, that, that someone in the faith community might need to provide. So just I was, gonna, I, was gonna, I was just gonna add that um, that because of COVID, we there are so many more things online. So um, I, that's actually one of the maybe side benefits that we wouldn't have expected, but because there are so many church services online that there are people who might find it difficult to go, you know, under normal circumstances, they would have a hard time because they're too shy or their mental illness, they can't get out of bed that morning or it's just not a good day. But there are ways to access spiritual support online that we have not had in the past. For that, I'm really grateful. Um, I, I've, I think many, many uh, churches, synagogues, whatever, that are able to at, put their services online are finding a great increase in attendance as people are able to take in spiritual support uh, without having to um, go anywhere or put themselves in those kind of situations. Yeah, I think that's really true. Lisa. Yes, I, w I see in the box questions about, um, and Harold touched on this a bit, about what if I'm not receiving spiritual support from my community? And I thought Harold's point was well taken, then find a community that is supportive of you. And I can give an example of that. Um, there was a woman of very little means who um, had a uh, child out of wedlock and was not allowed to baptize her child. And that was very heartbreaking to her and she felt a dearth, a severe dearth of social and spiritual social support. So her grandmother came along and baptized her baby in the ocean, which is a lot of water. And then the mother and daughter went on to join a different faith community where they felt great amounts of spiritual social support. So I, I don't want to dodge that. I want to address it directly, which is find the community that truly supports you for who you are, um, because spiritual social support is life changing. Well, as happens every time we have gone over our time, I want to allow um, any closing remarks from Dr. Koenig or Kay or Lisa before we close up here. Any last thoughts that you've just had as we've been having this exchange? It's a joy for me to see this work implemented by our colleagues. There's 2,000 colleagues together right now, and people truly are seeding a more spiritually supportive mental health and recovery field. The work you're doing every day is transforming the field. And we're so delighted in this series of webinars to be part of this transformation. Absolutely. Dr. Koenig, Kay, any closing remarks? I just, my, my closing remarks are that, you know, there, this has been such a rich webinar. There has been so much truth that's been, that's been said during, during this hour. I just hope that, that, that Kay's, experience, suggestions, um, all of these things, the wisdom from Lisa, the, the research, Shannon's observation, all of these things are, I just hope it can get out. Tell other people about this webinar. Um, find a link, you know, <laughs> send a link by email to, this is eventually going to be on some kind of platform. And so send a link to, to everybody, you know, uh, about what's about about the, about this webinar i would just encourage that those, those are my final remarks that's actually a perfect closing comment leading into my closing comments dr koenig so thank you we will be sending the link to this recording in our follow-up email that will go out in the next day or two we would be delighted if you would share that with people in your community, people who maybe you want to have better understand uh, supports for families living with mental illness, um, a faith leader who you would like to encourage, um, I just would encourage you to share that with them. We'll also be sharing the slides uh, from today's program, so be watching for that email to come from our office. The uh, Next webinar in our series is not two weeks from today. We've done all of them on Tuesdays. 
But our next one is Thursday week. So it's Thursday the 19th because we did not want to have a webinar during Thanksgiving week. So Thursday the 19th will be our fifth webinar in this series and it's titled Spirituality and Relationships, Contributions to Faith and Forgiveness in Recovery. We have two remarkable speakers for that program, Dr. Pargament and Dr. Kurt Thompson will be joining us for that program. So we hope you will join us for that. And the registration link for that will also be in that email. So watch for that email from us in the next couple of days. Uh, we are delighted to have you join us today. If you have any questions that didn't get answered today, please feel free to email us at partnerships at hhs.gov, partnerships with an S at hhs.gov, We'd be delighted to interact with you further. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Lisa, as always. Kay and Dr. Koenig, it's a joy to be with you today. We appreciate your contribution. Everybody have a great day. God bless you. God bless you.